This video is brought to you by me. For $1 a month, you can support the channel directly and help me keep doing what I love. Thanks for watching and supporting. Bubbles are a great visual representation of fragility. It's why we use the term to describe the economic event of rapid growth in a particular market. The more the market grows and inflates, the less sustainable this growth becomes. Once these assets stop returning on their investments, the bubble bursts, sending value through the floor. The problem with living through bubble eras is that you usually have to wait until after the bubble crashes before realizing you are living in a volatile market. It's appropriate then that Yakuza 0, a prequel to a series that had five mainline releases before it, came out when it did. Not only is it a great entry point for people like me who started the series with this game as it's the first chronological game in the series, but it also fills in the blanks of how the Tojo clan took shape before the series started. Like a study on a bubble economy, we can learn a lot about how we got to the events of the first game by looking back on the events of Zero. The game takes place in 1980s Japan during the country's bubble era of rapid growth. I am no economic expert and I am trying to explain this time period as simply as possible, so please bear with me if you are an expert economist. Also if you are an expert economist, please feel free to shed some light on the events in the comments below. Between 1986 and 1991, the country's economy boomed as Japan emerged as an economic superpower as their homegrown companies started exporting products across the world. After an accord with the United States that agreed to lower the value of the US dollar and strengthen the yen, Japan found itself with a lot of buying power, and to feed the bubble, banks were offering rock-bottom interest rates as low as 2.5% to promote business development. Japanese companies were buying land in the US, namely in LA and New York, mainly Rockefeller Center is probably one of the most famous examples. And back in Japan, the real estate market exploded, driving an increase in urbanization and growth. However, at the core of this internal growth was a rotten center. In Japan, banks were pushing loans on everyone, whether they needed the money or not, in order to meet lofty goals. The valuation of land was also artificially inflated, and people would buy up land or sell their own land in order to cash out, buy more land, flip it again, and so on. This is a concept called speculation, meaning you buy an asset like land or a sealed copy of Earthbound under the expectation that it increases in value and you can sell it for more than you paid for it. In many cases, this is high risk, high reward. But what always seems to happen with this buying and selling and buying and selling and constant increase in value, someone gets stuck holding the bag when the reality of the situation sets in. We've seen it with Pokemon cards, video games sealed in plastic shells because of their quote-unquote condition, and most notably in the last few years, NFTs. Yeah, gross, get out of here! <laughs> the market always stabilizes. Eventually the spending had to be reeled in and the Ministry of Finance decided to limit the amount of loans that could be borrowed for land development. So now all these companies that took out loans to buy land that they would flip we're now left with a bunch of overvalued land and no way to pay back the interest. Companies weren't growing fast enough to fill these colossal buildings and factories they built. Small businesses that were pushed to borrow more than they needed weren't earning enough to pay back these loans. And the booming industry ground to a halt as many of these companies went bankrupt. The country's economy crumbled in on itself as the extraordinary amount of debt swallowed Japan. The catastrophic economic crash that led to financial and cultural turmoil has led to the era following the burst becoming known as the Lost Decades. It's important to understand, at least on a basic level, what the context of the era meant for Japan when looking at Yakuza 0. While the game takes place mainly in two fictionalized cities, they are based on real cities in Japan. Kamurocho, the red light district, is based on Kabukicho, and Sotenbori, the entertainment district, is based on Dotenbori. These areas in-game are vibrant and lively as the short-term benefits of the bubble era set in. Money is a central piece of Yakuza Zero's story, and more specifically, the money involved in real estate. This pile of cash everyone is grabbing from seems to be limitless, and no price seems to be too high when it comes to buying more property. But money isn't always enough to get their way. The different parties trying to buy Japan's skyline resort to dirty tactics to drive people out of their homes and businesses. They hire squatters to hold apartment space and prevent construction on buildings. They hire homeless people to wreak havoc on tenants who refuse to relocate. With one wave of their hand, they can buy or weasel their way into any property they want. 
But one piece of land has everyone scrambling. The empty lot, a tiny little slice of land that holds larger implication than its physical footprint. The Camarocho revitalization project, a large-scale development plan, hinges on this microscopic piece of land. The only problem is no one knows who owns it, and if the project continued on, it could be brought to its knees if the owner later revealed themselves and staked a claim on the land. So now the Tojo clan, a Yakuza group in Japan, and the families it consists of are all racing to find the elusive owner in exchange for power down the line. The person who delivers the owner will be nearly guaranteed to move up the ladder of the clan. This is where our story begins for our two protagonists. Kazuma Kiryu is an even-keeled member of the Dojima family. He joined the Yakuza to follow in the footsteps of his mentor and Dojima captain, Shintaro Kazuma. Kazuma raised Kiryu as an orphan, and has been a father figure for him since he was young. Kiryu is pulled into the drama of the empty lot when someone he roughed up for not paying a debt winds up dead via gunshot. The suspicion falls on Kiryu and instead of following orders from his superiors to turn himself into the police, he vows to find the true killer. In doing so, he rescinds his membership with the Yakuza in order to avoid red tape and familial politics, placing a target on his own back as well as Kazuma's. Our second protagonist, Majima Goro, is initially portrayed as the manager of the popular Sotenbori cabaret, The Grand. It is soon revealed that he is imprisoned in Sotenbori. Trying to pay off his debts and get back under the good graces of the Shimano family under the Tojo umbrella after he plotted to kill a leader in the organization with one of his Oath brothers. The race for the empty lot leads to a lot of infighting within the Tojo clan as everyone tries to fight for their own interests and upward mobility. While the organization never fully splinters apart, sides are taken and people are stabbed in the back as the families try to play 4D chess and predict everyone else's moves before they happen. While it takes until the end of the story for the two protagonists to come face to face, their actions overlap with each other's and they directly influence the other's narrative. Having two protagonists chasing the same goal from very different perspectives really emphasizes how much disarray and disorganization there is in the Tojo clan, as well as how much money is being thrown at this project. Billions of yen are being pumped into the economy either legally or in more of a gray manner, and the cities the game take place in feel like they are rolling in excess. Locals waste small fortunes in ridiculous underground catfight clubs where people are betting millions and millions of yen on women who are beating the living hell out of each other. Majima also stumbles into a hotbed of illegal fighting as he tries to track down the owner of the empty lot. In this place called the Bed of Sticks, the worst of the worst criminals battle it out in a war of attrition, trying to survive a certain amount of fights in order to win their freedom back, all for the entertainment of wealthy people who are looking for new forms of entertainment. Money gets to a point where having enough is of little concern to the player. Eventually Kiryu learns to distract people by throwing money into the air around him, keeping them occupied long enough to let him get away from fighting. I also think the choice of these two protagonists is great because of how differently they approach the story. Kiryu is a calm presence and lives by his own set of rules. At his compass's center is respect. During the issue where he is framed for murder, he tries to handle the situation honorably and by the book. Instead of running away, he faces the music as quickly as possible. Not only are his name and innocence at stake, he knows the bad publicity reflects poorly on the Dojima family name. Goro, in contrast, feels like a caged animal that is about to escape his enclosure and claw the nearest person's face off. He counts the seconds until his debt is paid off, and as soon as he finally raises the money he needs and presents it to the Sagawa family patriarch, Tsukasa, Tsukasa moves the goalposts on him. He clearly has this ball of rage inside of him that gets stoked with every passing moment. These two very different energies are consistent with how the game plays as well. Yakuza's main gameplay system is brawling. There are random encounters as you stroll through the streets, and in order to finish key moments of each chapter, you have to go fist against fist with final bosses. Each character has three fighting styles that they learn over the course of the game. Matching his demeanor, Kiryu has Brawler, Rush, and Beast fighting styles. He learns Brawler from a former prize fighter, and Rush from a con artist who challenges people to fight for money. Beast is my favorite style because it lets you use objects around you as weapons, and it involves strategically taking hits to set yourself up to hit back. These are more traditional fighting types in contrast to Goro's more frantic fighting styles. Where Kiryu fights with a bit more discipline, Goro goes for a more street fighting approach. His fighting styles are Thug, Breaker, and Slugger styles. The Thug style is a visceral set of moves that knock the wind out of you with how hard the hits look. Breaker is a breakdancing fighting style that lets you use b-boy moves to knock out opponents. Slugger allows you to bust skulls with a baseball bat. 
These character personalities are consistent as they explore the two different cities, and how differently their stories play out keeps the story feeling new. What really drew me into this game and made me only want to play this and nothing else was seeing the evolution of these two characters and how they learn to navigate a world that is becoming alien to them. Kiryu's honor and respect, staples of many protagonists in media, seem to hold him back here. In the seedy underground world he lives in, he feels like an outlier, almost naive to how the Yakuza handles business. When Kiryu goes to a restaurant to investigate the real estate company that has been throwing around muscle to monopolize the land around Kamarocho, a group of Tachibana real estate brutes show up to bribe the restaurant owner to leave like everyone else in the building. They literally slap the man in the face with stacks of money. Kiryu steps between the man and the brutes, saying they are disrespecting this man in front of his crying child. Kiryu risks a fight where he is outnumbered, only for the man he was standing up for to grovel on the floor and take the money anyway, saying it was all part of his plan to hold out until he got the biggest sum possible. You can tell by Kiryu's face that he is starting to question who was right and who is wrong here, and he questions if anyone will give up their morals for the right price. Despite removing himself from the Dojima family, Kiryu is still a dead man walking in the eyes of the Yakuza. They eventually put a citywide hit out on him as he becomes a convenient scapegoat to oust Kazuma from his position of power. If they can point to Kiryu as a problem, they can also use that as leverage to question Kazuma's judgment of character. Undeterred, Kiryu keeps investigating to the best of his ability, eventually finding sanctuary within Tachibana real estate as he becomes the right hand to the owner of the company. Siding with Tachibana continues to build friction between him and the Dojima family, and he keeps crossing paths with patriarchs of the factions within the Tojo clan. He loses respect for all of them as their corruption overtakes them. They point to Yakuza tradition and jest. When Kiryu leaves the family and one of the Dojima family lieutenants, Daisaku Kuze, continues to fight him despite Kiryu now being a civilian, which is seriously against the rules, the other lieutenants point at him and mock him, saying, If you were really the Yakuza you say you are, who lives by the code you spout off, you'll cut your finger off for going against the rules. After he does, he gets demoted. These same lieutenants that made Kuze cut his finger off are also responsible for much of the drama in the story. Hiroki Awano doesn't really seem to care about the Kamarocho revitalization project or any of the politics involving the Yakuza. He just wants to live the high life and resolve all of this tension so he can go back to not being bothered. Even if it means framing Kiryu for another murder. Because if he wins the seat of power by producing the owner of the empty lot, he is basically sure to never be bothered ever again. Kiryu consistently faces foes more powerful than him that defy his moral code, and through sheer determination and focus, he continues to prevail, even when he almost gets a bullet in the back of a head when it seems like there is nowhere else to go. Goro has a similar arc in that he learns he isn't as cold-blooded as he thinks he needs to be. Sagawa offers him the opportunity to erase his debt by doing the Shimano family a favor. There is a hit out on someone, and they offer Goro the chance to carry it out in exchange for his freedom. Very few games I have played before this way human life quite like Yakuza 0 does. The story's events are kicked off by one person's death, rippling across Kamarocho. And then when Goro accepts the task of killing the target Sagawa assigns him, Goro is warned multiple times that you never uncross the line of taking a life. Once you do it once, you'll always carry that weight with you. And when all the chips are down, Goro still can't bring himself to do it. All he has to do for freedom is kill someone and his debt will be wiped clean. It completely subverts the expectation of what someone outside of the gaming landscape might expect from an M-rated game about the Yakuza. The stakes never feel low here. Like the longer you take to clear Kiryu's name, the more pressure he has on him from the Tojo clan. Events in the story keep begging me to continue like a good book you can't put down. But when things get too heavy, you get a chance to set aside the story for a bit and explore Sotenbury and Kamarocho these dense cities with endless people to meet and activities to partake in. In the early game when Kiryu still sports his Tojo clan pin, people avoid him, afraid they will get hurt. But once Kiryu drops out and becomes a civilian again, he gets to see a new side of the city he hasn't experienced. One of my favorite parts of this game was just seeing Kiryu react to what society is up to and what the normal people care about in daily life. At one point Kiryu stumbles upon a long line outside of an electronics store. He learns that a new video game is coming out, and this way he responded with the innocence of a child just made me so happy. Hmm. 
The assertive and tough nature Kiryu exudes gets him involved with a film crew, which then leads him to working on the set of the Thriller video where he has to protect international pop superstar Miracle Johnson from overeager zombies. He goes out of his way to help people and it usually gets him into wacky situations I've never seen before in a game. These interactions with people in the city really balance out how serious the main story is with humor and goofy fun. And there is so much of it. You can just keep scratching away at the surface and finding more and more, with extensive mechanics built out to supplement it. Eventually Kiryu takes the reins from a washed up real estate manager and you work with the citizens you have helped in order to manage and protect the property you own around Kamurocho. Goro has his own set of side missions that acclimate him to the city as well. He pretends to be the boyfriend of a girl who is tired of her father playing matchmaker. A random passionate citizen preaches the future of cell phones, but when you go to use it, the battery's dead. So after finding a battery around town, you finally get a chance to use it, and then you have no one to call. <laughs> the two cities really want you to lose yourself in them. Between the stores that sell specialty products, to the restaurants that have health perks, to Sega arcades with playable cabinets and UFO catchers, there is ample to do outside the story. I spent a lot of time just playing Outrun and Space Harrier, not to mention the embarrassing amount of time I spent trying to collect all the Genesis collectibles from the claw machine. It's a real feat that this team created such an impeccably populated world that takes place within like 10 square blocks. By the time the story was winding down, I was thinking about all the things I loved about Yakuza 0, and when I really started to weigh it against other things I've played, I started to realize that for a certain kind of person, this game is essential to play. Every single company that wants to make an open world game needs to use Kamurocho and Sotenbori as the bar to clear. It tackles a very specific time and place and encourages walking around, walking into stores, and talking to NPCs because you never know when something new will unveil itself. Before you know it, you might find yourself in a public park teaching a down-on-her-luck dominatrix how to be more assertive to clients who just want to be talked down to. You genuinely never know what is coming next. So while you could ignore everything and just blaze through the story, I found myself just as engaged by the people around Kamurocho and Sotenbori who were just looking for some help to get by. As my first entry to the series, it was an incredible adventure. From top to bottom, I loved Yakuza 0. I missed it when I wasn't playing it. And if that doesn't tell you everything you need to know, I don't know what does. So what's the best Yakuza game? Let me know in the comments. If you like the video, leave a like, and if you want more videos like this, hit the subscribe button. I'm trying to hit 900 million subscribers by the end of the month, and the sooner we start hitting these ridiculous goals, the sooner you can start saying you liked my old stuff better. If you want to go even further, you can check out my Patreon. For $1 a month, you can interact with me directly and get content you can't get anywhere else. I've been trying out some new types of videos on there, and I am trying to make it even better, so now is a great time to check it out. I want to thank my higher tier patrons, Okayla, Kaylee, Just Jessica, Kuda Hori, BBF and Bloxburg, Andrew Elmore, Andrew Donahoe, Conjo, and Benjamin. These people and all my patrons help me keep the metaphorical lights on, and I appreciate the support immensely. Until next time, have a wonderful rest of your year.